My name's Adele Sluzis. I'm the Visual Arts Curator here at The Mill, a multi-arts organisation based in Ghanayata, Adelaide. I'm here today with artist Evie Hasiotis. Hello, Hello. Evie. Hi, Adele. And we're going to be having a chat about her upcoming exhibition, Zenitia. Is that how you pronounce it? Well, yeah, I guess in English you would, but in Greek it's Xenitia, because go. we've got the X sound instead of the Z. So either way. Excellent. Um, so I wondered if you could uh, start by telling us a little bit about your practice as an artist and how you came to be an artist. Um, yeah, I, the first time I did any art really, I mean, I must have done a tiny bit of high school, but ended up going into the sciences and ended up then doing physiotherapy, which is pretty scientific. And it was in 95 that it was after my um, third child was born, I was living in Sydney and I'd gone through a lot of changes within a year within our family and I just needed some time to myself and I took up art classes at a local school, Bondi Art School, and it just opened up a whole new world and I thought, wow, it was like three hours of drawing or whatever I was doing. I think I started with watercolour and then the teacher got ill and then I did mixed media and that was a real learning curve to start with some texture, which I still use quite a lot, um, and not knowing what the painting was gonna end up like. It could be anything. And I still quite like working that way. You're drawing a lot from your own personal experience. Um, so tell us a little bit about why you've been drawn to make this body of work and also um, what it's been like to sort of uncover some of the themes that you've been talking about for you personally. The reason I went into this was there was a few things that happened um, in my work life that triggered some things. And I'm working with children, as you know, and something that happened triggered some stuff for me that came from my childhood experience. And I realised that I actually hadn't grieved for leaving my village. And um, I never even thought about grieving a place. And I had to work through that with seeing a counsellor. And that was really useful. Um, and some other stuff came out for me. So yes, I think doing the art may have triggered some other stuff that I had to deal with. And my art has always been a really healing thing for me. It helped me to explore what I actually went through as a child. And working with children, you're actually confronted by the child's point of view on a daily basis. And um, yeah, that's also really healing, I think, for me too, to be working with children at the same point, having to uh, recover those memories and work through them mm. to get to a different place. And my art has helped me to do that, yep. We're so lucky um, that we're sitting here in your studio today and so we've got some of the work yes. from the exhibition with us, including uh, this painting here, yep. which is of yourself and your sister, sister as a yeah. child? It's based on a photograph, um, probably about, I think, six months or so before we left the village to come to live in Adelaide. And my father used to cut our hair <laughs> because there was no hairdressers in the village. We did have a shop. But what I realised in the grief, uh, going back to my grief at six and a half years old, was also that there was all these positive things about being in a village. Everyone knew me. I was allowed to roam the wild plains. No, no horses. But, you know, used to get up to tricks with friends and my cousins who I was really close to. Um, so it was a really safe place, but in a sense there wasn't uh, any boundaries in you know, like my grandmother wanted me to come home, she would call and we would hear her and we would come home. I think that I've seen a bit of that through this process of you making this exhibition mm. as well, that you often talk about your sister's feedback as you've been yes. making things. Because she's been giving me a lot of, she's at least three times said that my art's really um, developed a lot more since I've been at, um, in this studio at the mill. She said, oh, Evie, it's really changed. Mm. What? is really interesting about some of the portraits that you've done for this exhibition is, um, you know, often we think of uh, a portrait as being something that celebrates or maybe uh, shows someone's importance. But in so many of your portraits, um, there's almost, yeah, that grief is a little bit palpable and yes. and there's yes. an uncertainty and, um, and that sort of thing. Mm. Do you want to talk a little bit about that? Yeah. 
Um, the painting up here, which is Sitza, which was also, this was fashioned on a, a passport photo. It was a family passport. Of, so I was probably that age, six and a half. And there was a look in, in, in the picture, which I think I managed to capture when I did this. This is in, in oil. And as it's obvious, my artwork isn't realistic art because that's not what I do. But I do capture some of the emotion um, of what that presents. And so that was a, a bit of anxiety. And going back to that leaving the grease thing, um, I've had a journey with anxiety and I'm nearly 100% sure it started when I left the village. But I have learned to deal with it. Um, and I've come, come out of going through those places where I've acknowledged the grief and gone on to um, other places where I can be more me, myself. When I went back to Greece, and that's part of, we'll talk about later, about the film I made called Made in Greece, I ended up swimming at one of the beaches in Northern Greece. That's where I was born, in Northern Greece, not near the beach. <laughs> and uh, this painting came out of that because there was a photograph that Gordon took of me swimming. And to me, that photograph, I often get titles for things months, if not years later. Um, it just takes a while to, for that to come out. And I was struggling with how to name that one and I called it Liberated. And then someone who's visited the studio said, a good name for this would be Venus Liberated. And so, yeah, so it was just like, I, I worked by scratching into the paint. There's no real texture, but it's actually on wood. And I like to play a lot and experiment with ink because ink, when, you're st when I'm stuck, ink just really helps me to let go. Mm. Yeah, so this was the freedom after finally working out what happened to me as a child and how I carried that throughout my life for quite a long time until a few changes um, brought me to the place where I felt free to be myself. Mm. So it's a positive ending. Mm. And I think um, there's this really beautiful expressiveness in in this painting that um, you can sense that uh, that lightness of spirit mm -hmm. in it. Uh, so maybe that brings us to talk a little bit more about your process and materiality. Um, you've got a few different techniques that you use um, in different areas of your work, and there's often lots of layers and uh, big gestural movements um, alongside these portraits. So mm. can you talk a little bit about a few of those processes? For, for this project, Sanitia, I have actually used photographs for some of my paintings, whereas usually I just start with creating some texture. Uh, the one that was over there, the um, With Time Memory Softens, that was renamed because I did that very soon after I did the Patrice, the one which is still at home, but um, which will be up in the exhibition. That one I started with paper. So I've created texture with paper. Uh, whereas with this one over here, which is called Leaving the Village, um, I've stuck hessian on there, but it's very loosely woven hessian, which I wanted to play with. So I just felt like it just comes to me. I just feel like, yeah, I really want to use this texture. I've used no gaps, which people think is really funny, but it works really well. And sometimes then I just put some paint on or sometimes I put the paint on with the no gaps and it kind of all drips in. So I just like kind of making it a bit messy. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah. And then in the Patrice, you also have collaged some yes. of those photographs. Which I yes, really I photographed beautiful. photos in the Patrice and that's the boat, the name of the boat that I came out in. There's, there is a photograph actually up here that... Um, I sort of just looked at it and I just got the, I get the essence mm. and then I stuck on the paper um, to create um, just the texture. But some of the photographs had photos of my family when we were on the boat mm -hmm. and some after we came off the ship to live in Adelaide. And then I just looked at it and just drew with acrylic and created a boat type image. Mm. And I've had a lot of comments on that one from family and friends really enjoying it, which is good yeah. to get that. Yeah, definitely. Fantastic. Mm. Um, and then there's a story with this one as well where you painted it and then repainted it. Yes, it was funny because it was, again, my sister who said, oh, what, what about the knife? Why is there a knife there? And I said, I don't know. She has to hold a knife. Mm. I do. And so 
I, th I think it was her who made this comment about the knife and I painted over it, got rid of it, and then one of the other artists here said to me, I really like that painting, and I said, whoops. And then while she was here working in her studio, I repainted it. Mm. So I called it Captivated after um, someone I know who works near my house. I showed her a photograph of it and she said, um, yeah. It's something to do with, with standing up for who you are and protecting yourself. And there's a little bit of that domestic violence theme in there. The centrepiece for the exhibition really is the film that you've made, Made in Greece, which talks about you returning to your village, mm -hmm. um, which was uh, really quite an experience for you. So tell us a little bit about how you came to make the film and that experience of going back home. Mm. Yeah, well, in 2014, my partner and I, which spoke about going overseas again, and he said to me, you should really, why don't we go back to the village you were born in? I don't know if it was intuitive. And I thought, I always thought, no, nah, I don't really want to go back to the village. You know, I went there once when I was 19, but I wasn't 19 anymore. Mm -hmm. well, we actually went to Thessaloniki, which is about three hours drive from where I was born. And it was the only place I could think of to stay because I didn't know who was living in the village. I didn't contact anyone who was still there. My village, which is called Asprula, but it, to go to the village and walk around the places that I did remember some of them, because I even when I was there when I was 19, I was studying when I went there. Um, it was, I felt like really at home and confident. Mm. And I think that's one of the big things that I lost when I moved at, at that young child of six and a half years old. I was lost my confidence and it took me a while to get it back. Um, again, it was that place of moving. Um, being wrenched away, actually, mm. yeah. And when going back to Greece, not only the village, but when I was around Thessaloniki and I met people who were from Pontos, which were the Greeks living in Turkey who had to come back to live in Greece in 1922, I think it was roughly. They were really like enveloped me and sort of as, as I was part of their family. And even though my Greek isn't of high quality, it, it, it was my first language. I guess it sort of is still in a way. Um, and it, they loved it that I could speak Greek and, um, yeah, I just, I felt, I felt some healing take place there too. Even in 2014 when we sta I stayed in a little um, town in, uh, on an island, the same thing happened. The children were playing in the street and that child in me, I guess, who had to leave her home, had some, something happen, something good happened, some healing happened when I watched the children in that little village. And there's a really powerful part of that film, I think, you standing in front of the house that you were born in. Yeah. Just that connection to place, mm -hmm. so important, mm -hmm. isn't it? You've sort of been investigating that transmission of culture and language, how it's handed down from people who were born in Greece and came to Australia to their children and even their grandchildren, mm -hmm. your children and your grandchildren, mm -hmm. um, what it means to pass that on. Yeah, I think in our family we have kept some of the traditions, um, probably not the church. They're, they are related to church, some of them, but I've sort of gone off church a bit uh, and my sister also and therefore <laughs> our children <laughs> as well. But um, I think one thing that came up in my film was the fact that the only regret I had was really not speaking Greek to my children and because oh, if I didn't speak it, I didn't speak it, and that's why they didn't learn it. Um, I mean, they've got a limited knowledge uh, of Greek, but I think that's the, the cultural thing and the, the artistic writing side. That's what I didn't realise when I was younger, when I was 19, 20s, in my 20s and 30s. But um, w with the traditions, I'm really um, quite pleased that my children uh, have taken the best of the Greek culture and are continuing... Uh, that on. They're actually quite happy to, and they're more proud of their Greek roots than I was 10 years ago. So this is quite telling. So it wasn't until I went to Greece on that last trip um, five years ago that I could say that I'm proud to be Greek. So speaking about migration, I, I feel like um, migration and immigration and global flows of people are just as important um, 
in the political landscape of Australia today as they were in the 1960s when you mm -hmm. came to Australia. So I wondered if you could speak a little bit about um, what's informed that aspect of mm. your exhibition and also the beautiful dolls that you have here. Yeah, um, yeah, because um, the whole exhibition sp sprang from migration, the migration of my family. But I, I, I haven't read a lot about how it affects children. And in these boats that I've made, <laughs> God and my partner helped me make them, um, I think I want to really link the migration of the 60s, the 70s, um, with my Vietnamese migrants, then later Afghani, though I've recently had to refresh my memory on these things. <laughs> Um, but it doesn't matter when it was, it's really the whole point is as a migrant, I feel that I have got a softer response to people who come in, came in in boats. It's not illegal to seek asylum. So yeah, I've, this, the, the dolls Can are made out, of yeah, yeah. The dolls are made out of different materials, but mostly cotton and sometimes it's new material, sometimes it's recycled. This was recycled, I think. And due, like I said, due to COVID, I couldn't run the workshops, but I sent these, some of these are made by other people. That was made by Jupin, who came from Taiwan. And these ones were made by, this one was made by my sister. Oh, and um, Eric from Holland, because we did have some um, people come in after the war from Holland, the Netherlands as well. Why is migration different? It's no different to what happened in the 50s, 60s, 70s. And yeah, it's all about, for me, human rights and letting people in and not being closed-minded. Our government, I, I feel, is closed-minded and cold-hearted. It's like we were, they welcomed uh, all the migrants in who they wanted to work in factories. Mm -hmm. And I've got some artefacts that my dad made at Metas because mm -hmm. he worked in sheet metal factory. Um, they'll be on display too. But yeah, just that connection that I, you know, I just wish Australia would do that, open its heart. And I think there's people who have opened their hearts, but you need your government backing to do that mm. too. So yeah, so these will be on display and they'll all have on them a name and where they migrated from. What I really love about these is that it brings it back to that the softness and the humanness and um, they're these 3D objects that I guess are more closely related to, to the body than maybe a painting. Mm -hmm. And then that childhood stuff that you were talking yes. about that, yes. you know, this is the doll of a child who maybe has been taken away from everything that they know yeah. and going yeah. to a strange place. But yeah. there's that comfort in being able to hold on to something. Mm, that's right. Like that. I did make a doll to take back to... Um, my village and wanted to give it to a child, but there was no children <laughs> in the village. So yeah, I left it um, at the cemetery where my grandfather's buried. There's one thing I want to share, Adele, that I, as you know, I did some interviews of migrants and children of migrants, which I wasn't able to utilize in this project, but I'm keeping the footage. And I did speak to my um, aunt who's in her eighties. Not many of my relatives of that generation are alive, but anyway, she's married to my uncle who has dementia. And we were talking about um, how I told her about my project, Senitia, which means roughly translated self-imposed exile. Um, and she said, there's a little story in the Greek community and my sister had heard it from someone else, that if you've got scales and you put Senitia, or the exile on one side and death on the other, xenitia or xenitia is heavier. Mm, yeah. So again, that goes back to the grief or what can be for those people and adults too, who leave their home. And some of them wanted to go back, I think those early migrants, but mm. most of them didn't. I guess that. It's honouring that, I yeah. guess too, honouring. Um, I think in my film I mentioned the word honouring the children who migrated because that was my slant on it was um, I thought maybe they're forgotten and the adults have written more about migration but yeah just honouring what it was, the process and um, acknowledging it and moving on.